Few people need no introduction. Today we have somebody who fits that category. Here we have the, a candidate for the 2016 president, Republican presidential nomination. I introduce to you Donald Trump. Uh, that was very nice, Paul. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. And I have to tell you, that's what I heard. I heard they had over 5,000 people that they had to turn away. So naturally, I said, why didn't you just take a bigger place? You would have made a fortune. But they didn't do that. This food must be very good to stay here. But I guess it's a long-term tradition. But to be uh, record-setting is always something I enjoy. You know, it's very, see that? Took a little while. <laughs> Took a little while. It's very uh, interesting because I've been doing this situation for a week and a half, two weeks, and it's been, I've really enjoyed it, actually. I've gotten to meet so many incredible people in New Hampshire and Iowa. I've been to so many different places, South Carolina, California. The other day I was in Maryland. We had a record crowd. We're having record crowds no matter where we go. And I think it's because I tell the truth. I don't need money. I don't need anything. I don't need campaign contributions. I don't need lobbyists. I don't need special interests helping me. The only thing I need is to do what's right for the country. That's all. Now, I don't know if that's going to translate. It might be translating because we've certainly done well in the polls. In fact, I see we're in second place. And I don't understand how Bush can be in first place, to be honest, because it's not going to happen. You know, when you're in favor of Common Core, meaning your children in Chicago are going to be educated through Washington, D.C., the bureaucrats, I don't think so. When you're weak in immigration, I don't think so. I've been very, very strong on immigration. Thank you. You're right. But I've been very strong on immigration, and we have to be. And I've taken a lot of heat, and it's unnecessary, very unfair heat, because, first of all, I love the Mexican people. I have a great relationship with Mexico. How can I not love people that give me tens of millions of dollars for apartments? You have to love them. But I love them for a lot of reasons. I love them for their spirit. But at the same time, we have to have borders. And this isn't for Mexico. This is for the world. We have to have borders. If we don't have borders, we're essentially not a country. And that's what's happening. Because you have illegals that are just pouring across the borders. Hundreds of thousands of people. And it's a tough situation for our country. You know, we owe 18 trillion dollars. That's going up rapidly. Very soon we'll hit the 19 mark. When we hit 24 trillion, that's like the point of no return. We don't come back from that. It's the magical number. And we become a large scale version of Greece. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen soon. So we have to be very, very strong on, on the borders. And we have to be very, very strong on illegal immigration. We have to do it. We have no choice. Now, it's been interesting because I've read so many stories. I've never had stories like this. If I do a building, I get two stories. And not even that. I announce a big building, and I get a little action. I announce Doral. Anybody go to Blue Monster? Pretty good place, right? The best. I took that. It was a sick puppy. I made it well. Now it's hot. We're building jobs all over the world. We're building a great one in, uh, in Washington, D.C., right on Pennsylvania. We took over the old post office, Pennsylvania Avenue. It's going to be incredible. We're actually under budget and ahead of schedule. Does the government ever say that? Under budget and ahead of schedule. And it's going to be one of the great hotels of the world. It'll be the best hotel in Washington. But what I do is I fix things. I make things better. Whether it's Doral, which is this phenomenal hundreds and hundreds of acres right in the middle of Miami, that was an interesting case. That was musical chairs. People bought it, sold it. Wall Street guys. They bought it, sold it. They kept buying it, selling it. Everyone buys it, sells it. They make 100 million. They make, then it got up to 550 million, and the market crashed. And I bought it down here. You would be very proud of me. But I spent money and fixed it and made it beautiful. And now it's one of the hottest resorts in the United States, and it's great. And a man came up to me from Doral, who was a member before, and he said, Mr. Trump, this is what, because it is beautiful. I blew it up. I mean, I built it. It's something really special. New clubhouse, magnificent rooms. The Blue Monster is brand new and incredible, done by Gil Hans. I did the other four courses. It was so incredible. 
and everybody loves it. And this member came up to me, says, Mr. Trump, this is what has to happen with the United States. And I said, you're right, because it's simple. Our infrastructure is crumbling. Our roads are no good. Our bridges are no good. I mean, you people have a big dose of it right here. We know, you know what I'm talking about. Our airports are a disaster. You fly into LaGuardia Airport, it's like a third world country. And you come out of Qatar, I go to a lot of places. You come out of Qatar and, and any, any place, I mean, China, Saudi Arabia, all these places, you come, you see airports you've never seen, then you land at LaGuardia or LAX or Newark, and you see what you see with the potholes and the stuff that's falling apart and things that haven't been painted in 25 years, and it's disgusting. And we're supposed to be the great country. And we can't let it happen. We have to take care of our country. But it's very interesting because the press treats me, I, I get a mixed press. You know, I've always had a great financial press. They always treated me well. But the political press is different. And what I do is I went to the Wharton School of Finance. I was a good student, really good. You know, to get into Wharton's probably the hardest school to get into or certainly one of the few hardest. And that was before anybody knew me. So it wasn't like, oh, great, I'm going to go. I have connections. I had nothing. But I go to the Wharton School of Finance, good student, really good student, smart. And then I go out and I make a fortune. And then I write The Art of the Deal. Who's read The Art of the Deal in this room? Everybody, right? Look. <laughs> Most successful business book, they say, ever written. I mean, the, the greatest. So I do The Art of the Deal. Becomes the number one bestseller on New York Times list for many, many, many months. And it's been great. And then I do a show called The Apprentice. Anybody ever hear of The Apprentice? And that was supposed to be a total failure. And in fact, I remember one of the critics saying, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen, sister, because the sister's a big fan of The Apprentice, I was told, right? <laughs> they said, this is the most ridiculous thing. Can you imagine Donald Trump? Now, to have a successful show on television, you need the women because the women have to be much more than 50% of the audience. And this critic, before the show came out, said this show is gonna be a total disaster because who would wanna watch Donald Trump, and especially women? The women will never watch him. And I say, am I so bad? Am I so, am I so bad? <laughs> and the show became a, a sensational hit, sensational. And most shows failed, 95, 96% of the shows that go on television fail. And even this, I'm not doing The Apprentice. Because when I run, I'm not allowed to because of equal time. In other words, if I do the, I think it's a ridiculous rule, by the way. The politicians, you guys should end that rule. Go to Washington. No, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I'm not doing The Apprentice. And, and you know, it's interesting. They renewed me. They renewed The Apprentice. And Mark Burnett called me up. He goes, are you crazy? You're going to run and you're not going to do, you're not taking a renewal. Everybody takes a renewal, which is true. You know, you have a show for one or two hours on television on prime time. And I give up. See, I give up a lot. So I give up The Apprentice and I give up hundreds of millions of dollars of deals because I'm doing what I'm doing, because we have to make our country great again. We have to. We have no choice. We have to make our country great again. So. I go to Wharton, I build a fortune, I do the art of the deal, I do The Apprentice, and then I watch these political pundits, most of whom are not smart people. <laughs> and they say, oh, isn't that terrible? Donald Trump, who's polling second. Can you believe I'm polling second? I haven't even started yet. But they say, Donald Trump, it's so sad that Donald Trump is taking the place of some senator who's like, give me a break or some governor who can't get himself arrested. <laughs> and I'm taking his place, like it's a terrible thing. So, I mean, it's really, it's really incredible. Then they call you all sorts of names. It's, they call the clown car, you know, clown, like I'm a clown, you know, I'm worth a fortune. I built this great thing, and I built it the hard way. I didn't build it like with some internet site that, you know, some love site that's worth uh, 600 million. I built it like with real estate and labor, and people building, and brick and mortar, and financing, and banks, and everything, and legal, and you know, the old fashioned way. And I have some of the greatest real estate in the world, and you know, it's something uh, really beautiful about it, but now I wanna do something else. And I really wanna make this 
very, very special, what we're doing. So, what I said is, when I ran, when I announced a week and a half, two weeks ago, I got such great reviews on this speech. I didn't use teleprompters. You know, it's like it, it, a, fr a friend of mine, Chris Christie, is going to announce tomorrow. And he's a good guy. He's, he is a good guy. But one of the things he said, he's not going to use a teleprompter. And they made a big deal. I've been saying that for six months. I don't use a teleprompter. I'd love to use a teleprompter. I'd have one here, one here, and I'd go like this. Ba-ba, ba-ba-ba-ba, ba-ba-ba-ba, <laughs> ba-ba. And everybody's going to fall asleep. And, you know, one of those things, right? But you can't if you want to really, in fact, I came up with a statement. If you're president, if you're running for president, you shouldn't be allowed to use a teleprompter because they don't find out who the real people are. But, but you get covered very, very unfairly. So they never mentioned my teleprompter, but they mentioned Chris's. That means to me, Chris will get good publicity. And that's OK. Let him get good publicity. It's not going to make any difference. Now, <laughs> now, one of the things I've been saying, and I say it very strongly, but it's a positive statement, but they may, the American dream is dead, but I'm going to make it bigger and better and stronger than ever before. I say it. So think of it. Good. But, but I say it. And then I watch myself on television. So I say, remember, the American dream is dead, but I'm going to make it bigger and better and stronger than ever before. Nice, you know, statement. So here's on television. I'm watching it just a little while ago. Donald Trump was very hard on the country. And they have me quoted. The American dream is dead. Cut. I said, wow, that's a hard statement. That's a hard statement. So they give you a hard time. Uh, then I talked about immigration uh, very strongly. And then Univision uh, tried to make a big political thing out of it. And the reason they did that, and who knows, maybe NBC will do the same thing. I don't even care. I don't care. Because I have to tell the truth. And the reason I'm doing well in the polls, and it's very interesting because I just got these, and CNN is back there live. I see CNN down there. So. But this is a CNN poll just came out. And they have interesting categories. Who's the best on terrorism? That's a pretty important subject. Trump right at the top. Who's the best on handling international trade? Like, not even close. Trump is like almost double anybody else, right? That's incredible. Then, who's best on handling the economy? This is from CNN. You believe it? Who's best on handling the economy? I like CNN, actually. <laughs> I might not like him after the next poll. <laughs> I, like him, I like him this month, right? <laughs> who's the best on handling the economy? These are all different inside the polls, right? And the best on handling the economy, Trump by far. Trump has 29%. The next is like Jeb Bush. I don't think he is actually second best. I can think of guys that are better than him. Okay? <laughs> so I'm best on terrorism, best on the economy, best on trade, best on like a lot of important things. The only thing I'm not so good on is like, who's a nice person? Trump is last. <laughs> I'm last. And I said to myself, you know, it's like, that's really fair. That's really unfair. Oh, who's the strongest leader? Let's see. Yeah, Trump is the strongest leader. So I, I look at this, I say, if I have all these things, why don't we just call off the election today? Let's put the country back in shape. It's true. They're pretty good categories. But I'm looking at what has to be done. And we have to get back to work. And we have to be less politically correct. And we have to be strong. And you know, you take beatings. You really take beatings when you tell the truth. Um, I've always said, and I've been saying it for years, uh, and I, I really, you know, I love running my company. I wish this country was doing so great because we're building all over the world. We're doing a great job. My son's here, Don Jr. and Eric and Ivanka. You've all heard of Ivanka. And uh, I have great children that are doing good. I have great executives. We're all over the world we're doing. I love, I, I would love to be doing it. But we can't. I mean, I had, this is why. They said, why this year? I said, it's just getting worse and worse. We're in a bubble. Remember what I said, we're in a bubble. We have artificially low interest rates, and those rates are keeping things going. And when those rates go up, I mean, I know you have a tremendous problem in this state with debt. When those rates go up, it's gonna be a very ugly picture for the country, because you know, you're paying low interest rates. On top of that, you're losing, the country's losing a fortune, this state is losing a fortune. 
and many states are losing a lot. We're in a bubble. It's artificial, artificially induced, and there could be a time where it's going to be a very unattractive picture, and a lot of things could happen that are not going to be nice. It's not going to be good. You look at what's going on today with Greece, the stock market's not reacting very well. I don't know what's going to happen. Who knows? I would think they maybe will make a deal all of a sudden. It seems that deals are always made out of, you know, out of nowhere something happens. But there's a lot of angst. There's a lot of turmoil. But you just, you just go along and, and you just have to, somebody has to come out and tell it like it is. Uh, I deal with politicians all my life. I've made a lot of money with politicians. They're really easy to deal with. And now with the exception of the folks in this room, because you have some politicians in this room, they're, they're outstanding. Every one of them. But other than the ones in this room, politicians are all talk and no action. They're all talk and no action. And we're never going to get to the promised land. It's not going to happen. You need people that are going to be truthful. You need people that are really smart and really know what they're doing. And when I said during my speech a week and a half ago, that I'm rich. That was another one. They cut me off. I'm really rich. But I didn't say, I said I'm really rich. And you have to be, that's the mindset that the country needs. I'm not saying rich in a braggadocious way. I'm saying rich because that's the mindset that the country needs. So that was another one. Just like I said, you know, before, this was another cutoff. I'm really rich. But they didn't leave the rest of the sentence. The mindset is, this is what has to happen. And, you know, you look at our country and you see what's happening. We don't have victories anymore. We, we, we just don't have victories. And I sell, tell people, when was the last time, as an example, we beat China in a trade deal? They just lowered their interest rate today. You know what that means? They're devaluing their currency even more. They're devaluing their currency because they're killing us. They are killing us on trade. And I'm a free trader. I believe in free trade. But, you know, the problem with free trade is you need smart people representing you. And we don't have those people. I know who the people are. I know the best. I would put X person in charge of China. Believe me, we will, we will absolutely do great. But China doesn't respect us. You know, I, I love China. I have people that pay me $25 million for an apartment. More. Am I going to dislike them? The biggest bank in the world from China, they're a tenant of mine. They pay me rent every month. And by the way, their lease just came up and they renewed. I said, oh, they'll never renew because nobody hits China harder than I do. And they come in, oh, no, we want to renew. I said, you do? That's nice. I mean, that's interesting. <laughs> you know why? Because they respect me. I also have great locations. That helps, right? <laughs> but they respect me. But, you know, friends of mine that are in the manufacturing business, they find it impossible to do business with China. And they get taxed. They send their stuff in here. And I buy it. I buy a lot of it. Because our companies can't compete. Look at South Korea. The other week, I ordered 4,000 television sets for a big job. 4,000. They all come from South Korea. And every time North Korea just rears its head a little bit, we send the destroyers. We send the battleships. We send everything over there. We send the aircraft carriers. To turn on the aircraft carrier costs five million bucks. We send aircraft carriers. We're going to defend. We, we, we get nothing. We get all the soldiers over there. I wouldn't want to even be those soldiers in the middle of that. But we get nothing. Saudi Arabia makes a billion dollars a day. A billion a day. We lose money. Saudi Arabia is so rich. They have the third most expensive. They spend third in terms of the military. In the world, they spend, they're number three in spending. Now, I don't know if their soldiers are going to run if there's a shot fired. We'll see, because you never know. I tell you what, in Kuwait, when they were having the problem with Iraq, if you remember, the shots were fired and they ran. And we had our beautiful Marines standing right behind them, and our Marines took care of the business, right? But, and I was just given, we were just talking, I was just given one of the highest awards that the Marines give Last uh, week at the Waldorf Astoria, they gave me an award on, it was a wonderful thing. And uh, actually, the gentleman, the general that gave it to me just became the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he's a very impressive guy. But the Marines took care of business. But if Saudi Arabia is making a billion a day, and you take a look at Yemen, where we have a border that doesn't end. 
The border is on Saudi Arabia. Do you think they're after Yemen? They're after the oil. They're not stopping at Yemen. And yet we get nothing. Why are we not getting it? I, I don't want to be, sound like a mercenary. But why aren't they helping out? Why aren't they doing something for us? Because without us, they wouldn't be there for 10 minutes. They have the biggest planes in the world. They have the biggest yachts in the world. They have the biggest... And without us, they're gone. It's like years ago with Kuwait. So Saddam Hussein, Iraq takes over Kuwait. That's it. The head people moved to London, most of them. Many of them took whole hotels. They didn't take a room. You know, we take a room. They took five floors. They took a whole building. They lived. We went in, beat the hell out of Iraq, and then we let everybody move back. We got nothing. And then a guy comes to my office, I'll never forget it, the Kuwaiti investment, and we were talking about doing a deal. And he said, no, 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 Donald. We don't invest in the United States. They don't like the United States. And yet we gave it back. How stupid are we? How stupid are we? So, you look at Saudi Arabia, you look at Japan. Japan has cars that you stay in Los Angeles in the area, and those boats come in, you wouldn't believe. You, you won't say, how big are those boats? They get bigger and bigger all the time. Thousands of cars, millions of cars a year. I mean, just, I never saw anything like it. They pour in. And I say, how much business do we do with Japan? When our farmers want to send stuff, they always protest and make it very difficult. How many Chevrolets are driving around the streets of Tokyo, would you say? What do you think? You guy's smart as hell, by the way. What do you think? <laughs> About three, maybe two? It's a different world. We lose with everybody. And then I talk about Mexico, and I love Mexico, but every time I talk about it, they accuse me of being a racist. And I have great respect for the leaders of Mexico. The problem is they're much smarter than our leaders. So you have plants going into Mexico. You have cars being built in Mexico. You have tremendous economic development in Mexico. You have a border which is very unsafe. I was really criticized for the border, but the truth is it's true. So I went out and we got, we got stories. I said, do me a favor. You know, they think that like the way I said it was fine, but they made it sound like I was very tough. Well, then I got out. I had one of my people, do me a favor, just check the border. Is it like safe? I don't know. They come back with stories that are mind boggling. So here's a story. So Univision's the one they pull out. I'll sue them. I'll sue their, you know, I'll sue them big league. I do fine with lawsuits. <laughs> but they pull out. And you know what? Maybe NBC will pull out because I don't know. Maybe NBC doesn't have the courage to stand up and say, we need strong borders. They could be. Maybe NBC will pull out. I don't know. You know, because the problem with these public companies, they get a little bit of pressure and they immediately say, oh, gee, we can't be associated with that. That's the problem with our country. So who knows what's going to happen? But I send people out and I get these articles. Now, this was an article by Fusion. Somebody said Fusion's owned by Univision, right? Is it? Does anybody know that? Fusion is owned by Univision. And it's in the Huffington Post. Very liberal. They don't like me. They write bad stuff about me, right? And it was just the other day, and here's what it says. So I'm, I'm making tough statements about the border, how dangerous it is, et cetera, and that people, illegals, are pouring across. And I, I get this article, I get many, I have many, many articles. There are hundreds of them, how dangerous it is. But I'm supposed to, they think it's like Mother Teresa's coming across the border, okay? This one says, 80% of Central American women and girls are raped crossing into the United States. Well, I said drug dealers, I said killers, and I said rapists. And they made the word rapist, they really picked that up. But here's an article from Huffington Post and from Fusion, which you'll have to check, but I think owned by Univision. So, I go through this and we go back to it. It's very hard for a very successful person to run for political office, especially especially for president. Because anything you say, anything whatsoever that you say, they'll call you names. They'll call you, you shouldn't have said this, you shouldn't have said that. And that's part of the country. And they don't even want to know the truth. And a lot of the public company stuff is very bad because these guys are running companies and they're afraid to do anything. But, you know, if for some reason 
the Miss USA, Miss Universe goes away. It's a very good company, very profitable, does great. I took it from a little puppy 14 years ago when it was losing money, and today it's very good. But who knows what's going to happen? I mean, you never know. But I have to tell the truth. I can't say, oh, gee, everything's wonderful. You can't say that. So when I look at the deals that are being made, and when I bring up as an example the trade that we're doing with Mexico and saying how Mexico is eating our lunch. I respect Mexico for it. I'm just disappointed with our people. We have the worst negotiators worldwide, but we have all of these terrible negotiators, and our country is getting killed. That's why we're losing money. That's why we have deficits. How about gross national product last week? GNP, below zero. That means we're becoming smaller. You look at China, you look at these other countries, if they go seven, eight, nine percent, they're like devastated. We went below zero last quarter. Below zero. I mean, I guess it happens, but I never even heard of it. Is there such a thing? We're getting bigger, we get more people, and we're going smaller. That's called, they don't know what they're doing. And I will tell you that if I win, I will be the greatest jobs president that God ever created. I will take jobs back from China. I will take jobs back from Mexico. I will take jobs back from many places. I guarantee you that Japan, which, by the way, just devalued the yen, will come across and be much nicer and much more respectful to us. Because, you see, we have all the cards. We've rebuilt China. They're building bridges all over China. And I mean bridges that make the George Washington Bridge look like small potatoes. We don't build anything. We're not building. Our place is decaying. In fact, we have 60% of our bridges and tunnels that they say are unsafe. Every time I ride over, I, re I read these reports, like 64% are in trouble. I'm driving over a bridge that's 400 feet over the water, and I'm saying, oh, I wonder if this one's okay. <laughs> And so we have to do something about it, because we have such tremendous potential. We have to take care of our military. We have to take care of our vets. Our vets are treated like third-class citizens, like third-class citizens. They build a hospital, cost like a billion three, and it should have cost a fraction of that and been much better. And people drive. You have a situation where one of the groups was telling me where they literally have to wait four and five days in a waiting room just to get in to see a doctor let alone to get fixed up. So our vets are being treated horribly, and they're our greatest people, you know, if you think about it. They're really courageous and great people. We wouldn't be here except for the vets. The military has a lot of obsolete stuff. We're getting smaller all the time. I'm in the real estate business, as a couple of you probably have heard, and all the time I get these listings for bases, bases. And one day I said, how many bases are we selling? We're selling so many bases. A naval base, or this base, an army base, a marine base. We're selling bases. I mean, how many do we have that we have to sell so many? Because we've never been in a position where we're so vulnerable. The enemy this time is a different kind of an enemy. They're silent, you don't see them, and very smart. And they're better at the hacking, and they're better at the computers than our people are, which is shocking. And they're convincing our youth and other people in this country to do lots of bad things, and we don't even know about it. So we have to be much smarter than we've been. I mean, they're saying that China hacked, remember it started about two weeks ago, four million people in government. Four million. It's a lot of people. But now they're saying it could be 30 to 34 million people. I didn't know we had that many people in government. They hacked everybody. Now, it might not be China, it might be Russia. You know, this country's so set on China. But it might be Russia. I say, why is it China? They have no idea. We're not doing anything about it. And yet, the St. Louis Cardinals baseball team is under investigation for hacking the Houston Astros, okay? <laughs> no, no, think of it. Did you read that story? It's like the big story, St. Louis Cardinals. Who the hell, I mean, look, it's wonderful. Let them do whatever they want. So they'll, they'll end up getting a picture. He'll end up being no good. He'll need Tommy John surgery, right? But here we are. We know nothing about what's going on. Nothing. We know nothing about what's going on. 
We're being hacked at the, at the level of probably 30 to 34 million people, and we're worried about the St. Louis Cardinals and the Houston Astros. It's incredible. It's incredible. So we have to straighten out our thinking. We have to create something again. We have to create incentive. We have to be a cheerleader for the country. You know, one of the things I loved about Ronald Reagan, he was a friend of mine, and I was a young guy. He was a much older guy, obviously, but he liked me. He went around to one group. He said, that guy's really smart. And at that time, you know, he didn't really know too much about me. But he said, that guy's really smart. He told me, maybe my friend made it up. I don't know, possibly. But Ronald Reagan liked me, and I liked him. But he had something that was really great. He was like a cheerleader for the country. You know, there was like spirit. My daughter, Ivanka, uh, her mother and grandparents lived in Czechoslovakia when it was a communist country. And she'd go there on the summers for a month and would go with Don and Eric, sometimes separately. And she told me the story the other day, I never heard it. She said, you know, Dad, when I was a little girl growing up, I'm in a communist country, seeing my grandparents. And the people in the country, smart people, hard workers, they had little $1 bills posted onto their windshield. And they were so proud. And all the cars had it. They had $1 bills or $10 bills or anything American, but they had anything from the United States. They just wanted it. And they would, she would say, you'd always see at least a dollar bill, and sometimes it would be a $10 bill, scotch taped onto their windshield of the car. They were so proud of just having that and having that little association with our country. You don't see that anymore. Today we're a laughing stock, we're a joke, we're all a bunch of clowns. Putin has no respect for us. I had the Miss Universe contest over there two years ago. I got to know these guys well. We can get along with them well. We can get along with them well. But Putin has no respect for us. He hates the president, hates him. Hates him with a passion. But there's no reason for it. There's no reason for it. And we fight for Ukraine, and I'm saying it's all fine. But why isn't Germany? Germany's making a fortune. It's one of the most prosperous nations in the world. And you have other countries, they're not fighting. We're fighting over the Ukraine. We're fighting for them. Why aren't they doing it? Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be, because we should be helping them out. But why are we always leading the charge? Why are we doing that? So we can make our country great again. But before we do that, we have to make our country rich again. And we can't because everybody is taking advantage of us because we don't have the right leadership. It's as simple as that. And if I win, we will make it rich. We will make it great. We will build up our military. We will save Social Security without cuts, by the way. And we will have a phenomenal country again. And I just want to thank everybody. You know, I, I really feel badly. I was very upset with the groups from, who's the head of the city club? Where the hell is he here? Uh, I said to him, my, my partner over here, I said, what the hell? You turned away 5,000 people. By the way, the press will not report that. Are you going to report that they turned away over 5,000 people? They won't report that. They will not report that. I guarantee you that. And I thought what we'll do with Paul and everybody is, while I'm here, we'll ask, uh, perhaps some people have some questions, and it would be my honor to ask. And, and this has been really a lot of fun. You're an amazing group of people, and a great city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Paul. Hold well on. Thank you, man. Uh, uh, just to clarify, uh, Mr. Trump, when you have a business relationship, you stick to your deal, right? Unless it's a bad deal. No. Yes. Okay. Yes. These people have stuck with us. That's through, true. I agree. Thick and thin. Sometimes very thin, right, Jay? <laughs> okay. Well, here we have a lot of questions, and some of them are duplicates. But since I'm the moderator catching all the heat, my, I'll ask the first question. August 6th, I believe, is the, the first debate. Are you going to be ready to share the stage with nine or ten Republicans and stay within the time limits and give and take, especially the take? Yeah, look, I'm not a debater. You know, politicians do this for a living. I, I create jobs, I create buildings, I create businesses that 
have been very, very successful. And I built a tremendous net worth and a tremendous lot of things. But I'm not a debate. I don't debate. Everyone's saying, oh, great. But you know what? I think I'll do fine. It's common sense. Hey, look, it's whatever it is, it is. But, you know, politicians, every night they go and they debate. That's what they do. They debate. They talk. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I guess I qualify. It certainly seems like I qualify. I think they're going to take 10, and I'm number two now. So I think I qualify. But uh, to, me, it's not, to me, it's not about the debate. It's about getting it done, really. But I'll be ready. Yeah. Great. Now we have a lot of questions, uh, probably more than we normally. Well, we'll take a few less than that. Good. Well, on the other hand, you know, to get ready for the debate, you have like 90 seconds, so terse is not worse. Ed Mazur, board member. Mr. Trump, what point in your life did you decide public service was more important than making money? That guy right over there, in case you don't know. Well, look, I've looked at it for, you know, probably eight or ten years, seriously. I looked seriously at the last time. I was very, very, I think Mitt Romney is a really nice guy, but I was so disappointed in him and his performance because that was an election that should have been won. He should have won the election. And I don't know, did he choke? Did he not? I, I'll say this about Obama, and you have to give him credit. He was on every show the week before the election, right? He was on Jay Leno. He was on David Letterman. He was, I called up Romney's people. I said, where are you? Where are you? You're getting killed. Where are you? And some, something happened, he disappeared. So I was very disappointed in his performance. But I, with that being said, uh, I will tell you that if I'm the candidate, there's not going to be any choking. I will fight like hell to win it. And I really think we have a really good chance. Hillary, probably it'll be Hillary, although you see what's happening. I mean, you know, crazier things have happened. This happened last time. It was going to be Hillary 100%, and then Obama started getting crowds. When well, they have Bernie Sanders is getting good crowds. And uh, who knows? I think it's still going to be Hillary. But she's very, very vulnerable on many different things. So we'll see what happens. Uh, this is from uh, Chris Christopher Anderson. Uh, affiliation, you'll like that. Realtors. Yeah, I, like uh, okay. <laughs> I think a lot of potential I deal know, makers. I see it. Yeah. Name, would you name potential Trump cabinet members? Uh, Secretary of State and Secretary of Commerce, assuming you win. Yeah. It, it's just too early. I mean, uh, you know, I don't want to think about it, to be honest with you. It's just too early. It's, uh, I get that question all the time. Who would you make Secretary of State? Who would you make Secretary of the Treasury? Believe me, we'll get the best. We'll get great people. But it's just too soon. We have to get there first. I don't like talking about things until we get there. I never talk about deals until they're done. You know, these guys, they talk about deals. Oh, I may, I'm going to make this one. And they never happen. I don't talk about anything. I always wait till we get it done. So I got to get one thing done first. Okay. A Karen, uh, is that Rector? Close enough. Public Health Institute of Metro, Metro Chicago. What are the most pressing public health issues that need to be addressed during the campaign? I think we have to knock out Obamacare and we have to replace it. It's going to be a huge problem. It's going to be a huge problem. Trillions and trillions of dollars. They spent five billion dollars on a website. It didn't work. The IRS just asked for a billion dollars because of the complexity. They have to hire tremendous staff at the IRS just to handle what's going on with Obamacare. And people don't know this about Obamacare, but it doesn't really kick in big league until 16. That's when it kicks in. It's going to cause tremendous problems. And on top of that, the deductibles are so high and the premiums have gone through the roof. It's just not something that works. So I think that's going to be a very, very big issue. And, you know, one of the things that Bush did is he uh, gave us Roberts. It was him that pushed it to his brother. Jeb Bush knew Roberts very well. And Jeb Bush pushed him. And honestly, it should be the Roberts care because two years ago he approved it. It should have ended. And now he could have pretty much wiped it out and he approved it again. So I think it's going to die of its own weight. It's, it's been a disaster. And doctors are leaving their profession. I don't know how many doctors you have in here, but doctors are leaving the profession because they can't handle it. I have one person, a friend of mine, who said, I have more, I have more literally, he said, I have more accountants than I have nurses because of the complexity of it. So it's not good for the people, it's not good for the country, and we can come up with a plan that's gonna be much better. It's gonna be great for the people and much better for the country and much less expensive. And there are numerous things, but there's one in particular that could really work. Thank you. Here is a very intriguing question. You may not want to answer it because you're not there yet, but, oh no, you, you can answer this. This is from Ashvin Ladd. If the current 
cabinet members were on The Apprentice. Who would you fire first? <laughs> and who would be the winner? That's a pretty, that's a pretty original question. I don't know. You'd fire plenty of them. Look, you, you see what's going on. You could fire all of them. Um, I, you know, I, I, the EPA is a disaster. It's, it's, it's killing us. The EPA. The regulations that they're imposing on businesses are incredible. But I, I think I'd have to look at Secretary Kerry. He's our chief negotiator. He's getting killed in the negotiation. The deal with Iran is a total disaster. They are tapping him along like a baby because he's not a negotiator. And then on top of that, at 73 years old, he participates in a bicycle race. And he falls and breaks his leg. I promise you one thing. I will never be in a bicycle race. And, and, you know, when you are negotiating, you should double up the sanctions, triple up the sanctions, go in there and really do a job. You should say, we want those prisoners back. You know, they've got four, used to be three, now it's four prisoners. We want them back now. They don't even ask for them. They don't even ask for them. Plus, we're giving them hundreds of millions of dollars a month. We're paying them hundreds of millions of dollars a month. And when the question was asked to the State Department, why are we doing that? They said, well, one thing has nothing to do with the other. Do you believe it? And on top of that, we're fighting them in Yemen. Other than that, the negotiation is wonderful. So I would have to say Secretary Kerry, and I think he's a very nice man, honestly. And I would, uh, I would absolutely, I think Jeb Bush is a very nice person, but he's not the right guy. He'll never bring you home. He's never gonna bring you home. Believe me, he will never, ever in a million years bring you home. But Kerry's a nice man, but it's, uh, that, that whole situation with Iran and the nuclear is absolutely a disaster. How about two more, if they're good? Okay, if they're bad, more. I'll do three. Two more. Two, got two more. Oh, there's plenty here, but I'm, I'm picking out the more unique question because you're going to be having all these questions, you know, all the other stuff. Mr. Trump, it appears you have done more deals in your life than there are stars in the sky. I thought you'd like that. Yeah, I thought you'd like that. Uh, what do you consider your best deal? Ah. These are pretty, this was the city club. We're not asking you. Yeah, that's good. It's an interesting question. So it's not my biggest deal. I would say Trump Tower on 57th and 5th would be only, it's not my biggest deal by any stretch. I built buildings on the west side from 59th to uh, 72nd Street, and I've done deals where I actually made more money. But Trump Tower was really, to me, and to this day, it's been successful from the day I built it. Right next to Tiffany, I bought the Tiffany Air Rights, and it's been, it's been a great deal. I mean, I've done a lot of, a lot of great deals. Just, I'm very proud of the building we have in Chicago. I'm really proud. And by the way, the sign, I love the building. I, I will tell you. So I have to tell you this. So the sign, people love it. People love it. And I said that that would be the Hollywood sign of Chicago. That's what it is. The other day, when I came, when I came here, there must have been 100 people in front by the river taking pictures with the sign lit up in the background. And people love it. And people that actually fought me on the sign, they fought me on it. They've now called me, almost every one of us, they say, you know what, we were wrong. It, it really looks great. And people love it. And, and you know, one thing happened that was interesting, because as you know, the mayor uh, put in legislation that nobody else can do that again, ever in the city of Chicago, ever. And you know, they called me and they wanted to know, what do I think? And I said, I fully support that legislation. <laughs> Sure. Nobody else. Last question, Donald. All right. He's on a roll, but last question. This is, this is another very good question. Carly Hansen, what are your thoughts on environmental uh, conservation and climate change? I, I think the biggest problem we have is warming. But it's not the kind of warming you're talking about. It's nuclear warming. We have got to get nuclear weapons out of the hands of maniacs, because that's our problem. I've received, and I said this, I was over at the Chicago Tribune, the editorial board before, and it was really nice. Of course, they'll probably kill me tomorrow, but these are mine. I remember when I said how nice, I had a lot of respect for the people I met today over there. And they asked me a similar question. They were talking about, you know, global warming, which is now extreme weather. You know, it was global warming, and this is, and that. Every week they come up with an extreme weather you can never fail. Unless the weather gets really calm, that could happen too, right? But 
I've received many environmental awards, and the Tribune was so surprised. I get a lot of them, and I believe really strongly in clean air and certain things. But the, the biggest problem we have is nuclear proliferation. We have to stop it, and we have to stop it now. We cannot let that happen, because that is a problem like no other. My uncle was a professor at MIT, a very brilliant engineer, scientist engineer, Dr. John Trump. And he told me many years ago that someday people will carry around a satchel, just a satchel, a briefcase, and the destruction that that briefcase will do will be mind-boggling. And I said, oh, Uncle John, you have to be kidding. You have to be, you don't mean that. He said, no, I'm not kidding. I was very young at that time. I was like 12. And he said, I'm not kidding. It is getting to a point that he was working on the Van de Graaff accelerator. It was a long time ago. But he was a brilliant guy, my father's brother. And he was talking about the power, and that was so many years ago. And today the power is far greater than even he would have thought. So we have to have the kind of a president that is respected where this can work out worldwide because that is really going to be the big problem. And there is nothing more important. I want to thank everybody. Paul, I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody. This is such a great honor to be here. I've had a fun, I've, I, so many of the people I know, and uh, I've been treated so well and so respectfully. I have so many people that just have treated me so well in Chicago. You know, they loved when I came in. I invested a tremendous amount of money. The building cost approximately a billion dollars to build. And as you probably heard, it got in Condé Nast Traveler and some others. It got Best Hotel in North America. Uh, it's it does great people love it and I'm very proud of it and I'm very proud to be in the city and I love the people of Chicago and good luck to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you We are, we are parting good oh.